Hello? Oh, Lord. Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the National Conference of State Legislatures and the Pew Charitable Trust for this briefing on confronting the opioid crisis at the state level. My name is Mandy Rafel, and I'm a program principal in the Fiscal Affairs Department of the National Conference of State Legislatures. I'll be serving as the moderator of today's webinar. What is the next slide, please? As a reminder, if at any time during this webinar you have any difficulty hearing the audio through your computer speakers, please use your telephone to dial in to hear the audio portion. The National Conference of State Legislatures is pleased to partner with the Pew Charitable Trust to bring you this webinar. In case you are not familiar with NCSL, we're a bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and staff of the nation's 50 states, its commonwealth, and territories. NCSL provides a number of different services, including research, testimony, and opportunities for lawmakers to exchange ideas on pressing state policy issues. The topic of opioid abuse falls within the jurisdiction of two NCSL standing committees, the Health and Human Services Committee and the Law, Criminal Justice, and Public Safety Committee. These standing committees provide a forum for the exchange of ideas as well as a framework for legislators to create formal public policy positions for NCSL. The committees meet twice a year at the NCSL Legislative Summit this year in Chicago, Illinois, and the NCSL Capital Forum, usually held in Washington, D.C. For more information on these meetings or NCSL activities and services to legisl legislative staff, please visit our website at ncsl.org. Next slide, please. The, the purpose of this jointly sponsored webinar is to examine state efforts to prevent opioid and heroin abuse, and expand recovery and treatment options for those suffering from addiction. This topic is very timely and one that has gone from relative obscurity to notoriety in just a matter of a few years. All one has to do is open a newspaper or turn on the television to grasp the magnitude of the problem. I understand today's webinar audience is more than 270, which may be the highest we've ever had for a webinar. I think this reflects the growing interest we're seeing from policymakers who are grappling with the many issues associated with addiction and want to make sure they're prepared to serve their constituents in the best way possible. Today's webinar features three presentations. The first presentation will provide an overview and highlight research conducted by Christine Vessel, author of a Stateline series on this issue. This discussion will be followed by presentations from two state legislators. Each of them will share different state experiences and perspectives. After we hear from our panelists, we will open up the, the discussion to include questions from the audience. To ask questions, you can simply type a question in the Q&A box in the right-hand corner of your screen. Your question will not be visible to everyone, only to the webinar administrators. We will take as many questions as possible within the time we have available. Next slide, please. Our first speaker, Christine Vessel, is a staff writer for Stateline. If you're not familiar with Stateline, it is a daily news service of the Pew Charitable Trust and provides reporting and analysis on trends in state policy. Christine has been working on a series of articles featuring the current opioid epidemic. Christine has 30 years of experience in the news business. Before joining Stateline in 2005, she wrote for McGraw-Hill Newsletters, the Financial Times Newsletters, and post Newsweek business information. She's been covering health policy for state lines since enactment of the Affordable Care Act in 2010. Next slide, please. Our second presenter will be Representative John Nigren from Wisconsin. Representative Nigren was elected to the state legislature in November of 2006. He is a fourth generation resident of Northeast Wisconsin and deeply rooted in the community with his wife, who is a high school teacher, and their three children. Representative Nigren strongly believes in the concept of a citizen legislature and continues his work with Great Lakes Financial Management Group. He began his career in financial services in 1998 and views it as a way to keep in touch with people of this district. He is currently serving his fifth term in the Wisconsin State Assembly and his second term as co-chair of the Budget Writing Joint Finance Committee. Next slide, please. 
Our third and final speaker will be Delegate Don Purdue from West Virginia. Delegate Purdue is a graduate of Marshall University and Ohio Northern University. He has served continuously in the West Virginia House of Delegates for 18 years, having been first elected in 1998. He served as chairman of the House Health and Human Resources Committee for 12 years and has acted as co-chair of NCSL's Health Committee and as a vice president of the NCSL Standing Committees for the past several years. He is a retired pharmacist with 35 years of experience in all practice settings. He and his wife currently reside in a, on a small farm near Huntington, West Virginia. We look forward to hearing from all three of our distinguished speakers and thank them for agreeing to participate in this session today. So at this point, I will turn the program over to Christine Vessel. Welcome, Christine. Thank you, Mandy. So I am going to give an overview of the issues that I've encountered in covering this topic for the past year. Um, we have uh, clearly gotten a lot of interest from governors, lawmakers, and the media over this past year and the year before. And uh, so I began covering it in January of 2015. And then in the last summer, I was given the opportunity to get into some depth uh, and choose an issue um, I chose within the healthcare realm. And I chose opioid, the opioid epidemic and specifically the lack of access to medication-assisted treatment. So I started my three-month uh, research on this, traveling to various cities. I went to Philly, to Boston, to New York, San Francisco, Cape Cod, St. Louis, and I'm still traveling, talking uh, to uh, doctors, uh, treatment organizations, politicians, about this issue of why more people aren't getting the medication, the three medications that have been approved by the uh, FDA, um, there's a bias. And that was the topic, that was the title of our series. Uh, it, it, the three parts looked at the overview of the resistance why it's there, and, and, and some of the, the numbers, the um, very chilling numbers of deaths in the um, epidemic. The next one looks at inmates and the lack of treatment inside uh, correctional facilities. And then the last one looks at um, a lack of involvement on the part of doctors in prescribing buprenorphine, one of the three medications. Uh, so, when I, got, when I got started on this, I found that this issue was very uh, confusing, complex, and nuanced, and uh, talked to dozens of people. Basically, the issue is one that is not settled. Uh, we talk about research-based um, methods, and there is much more research on the use of medications than on abstinence and 12-step programs, but there are a lot of doctors and, and other practitioners who prefer abstinence. So I, I was recently at the uh, meeting of the, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and I could, that, that was all doctors, medical doctors, psychiatrists, and there still are differences. So it's a, it's a very lively debate that um, is not going to be settled anytime soon. So when we look at the issues involving the general treatment uh, landscape, we see that about 70% of uh, treatment facilities do not use medications. And that's, that's where the problem starts. So the policy approach from the federal and state level is to get Medicaid to pay for medications and, and uh, private insurance and to try to encourage communities to work together so that the options are available to everyone. Maybe not all in one place, but at least through referrals. So that's, that's the uh, kinds of solutions that states are looking at right now. As for uh, getting more treatment into prisons and jails, that's evolving. But, uh, but so far, there's very little of it. And then on the question of buprenorphine, which you can see is one of the three drugs, um, 
and one that many people favor. There are huge differences. Doctors can prescribe this in their offices, so it's more convenient for patients. And, uh, and yet not enough doctors are doing that. Um, so the, the, on the other side, there are people that don't believe in medications at all, and also um, physicians who believe that maybe we're going too far in the direction of medication and, and not providing enough counseling. So again, it's a, debate, it's a debate that is not settled and will continue, um, but states and the federal government are pushing this because it, is, it has been neglected so far. So they're, they're trying to increase access. And ideally, everyone, again, should have access to all types of treatment. And insurance should cover all medications and all types of treatment. Muted. Okay, so, so the series came out in January and since then, and for the foreseeable future, I'm covering some of the other issues. Uh, going back to the issue of uh, medication and how to get more of that and more treatment generally to more people. Um, I went to Burlington, Vermont, where uh, the governor has made this the number one issue since 2014, and, and yet there are waiting lists there um, for buprenorphine and for methadone. Uh, through the, the hub and spoke system that is set up, it's, it's a, everyone agrees is a good policy, but it's still not enough. It's not providing enough capacity for treatment. Um, we are also I, so so two few prescribers is the chart that I included with that story, and you can see it shows the um, proportion of prescribers per capita per per person in each state, and it varies widely. And even though Vermont appears to have more doctors engaged in prescribing buprenorphine, it still has a waiting list. The next article, or, or next big topic um, that I've been looking at is reducing opioid prescriptions. Uh, the new CDC guidelines are expected to go a long way towards that. I have a story coming out on Monday that talks about prescription drug monitoring systems and, and states are trying to, to improve the effectiveness of those. This chart you're looking at shows that the number of deaths is very closely related to the increase in prescribing of opioid painkillers. And this chart shows that, again, like the number of doctors prescribing medications uh, to help people recover from addictions, we have wide variety in the number of opioid prescriptions prescribed by state. So another topic on, uh, that I've touched on briefly and, and plan to get into more is the use of naloxone as a rescue drug and Good Samaritan laws. So here you see a map again showing that states vary widely, but the trend is towards enacting legislation that allows people to help someone they find uh, who, who is overdosing, either by administering the drug naloxone, uh, calling 911, and, and not um, being uh, jeopardizing their own uh, legal, creating legal problems by being there when illegal drugs are being used. So that's another topic, um, and I also looked at the rise in neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, mothers who, pregnant women using heroin and opioids during pregnancy, and that's on the rise. Um, fortunately, there, there are treatments and, and the babies are able to recover and have pretty normal lives as far as research tells us, but it's at great cost. Uh, and um, there are, there's very little understanding of it. Um, so, so that is an issue that, again, is, is on the upswing and is not going away. And more and more hospitals and doctors are having to deal with that. So I'd like to, at this point, review, just to go over the issues that I'm sure the next two speakers are going to talk about. 
the number one issue that states are dealing with is stigma. Um, there's not enough uh, understanding of the disease, the chronic relapsing disease of addiction. There's not enough research, not enough uh, acceptance of um, people with addiction, not enough people in the profession, and not enough funding, specifically insurance coverage. Addiction medicine is not a part of mainstream medicine yet. Okay. So following from that, we also have uh, the three big topics that the federal government is looking at in states as well, which is decriminalizing addiction and drug use, greater access to treatment, which was the topic of my series, and harm reduction, naloxone, needle exchanges, and other ways of reaching out to people. And finally, prevention, which is reducing the number of opioids prescribed and uh, prescription drug monitoring systems, more education, and more diagnosis. Okay, good. So now I'm going to hand it over to Representative Nigren, and I look forward to your questions. Representative Nigren, are you with us? <laughs> Representative Nigren? Hey, should we um, instead um, delegate Purdue? Yes. Are you there? We'll switch the order. Okay. Hello, Representative Nigren, are you with us? Okay, how about Delegate Purdue? Christine, did you all mute everyone? Everyone should be able to speak. So to everyone who's participating in the webinar, please bear with us for just a minute while we find our speakers. Would it help to give them a number to call, like your cell number?
Hello? Representative Nygren or Delegate Purdue? Hello, um, Mandy. While we're waiting, I, I have a few more slides. I uh, used up my 10 minutes, but I have a, a couple more slides that we could look at. Um, I'd like to um, present the backdrop for this epidemic. Uh, it is you know, somewhat good news because potentially there is a lot of money available through Medicaid and private insurance that was not available until 2014 when uh, substance abuse treatment along with mental health and other uh, types of uh, medical and surgical services became required and called essential benefits. So that's big, that is a sea change for uh, insurance coverage of addiction treatment. And uh, you can see from this map that a little more than half of the states have expanded Medicaid to cover uh, low-income adults. And within that population of low-income, able-bodied adults um, uh, under 65, they, there is a much higher prevalence of substance abuse, uh, substance use disorders, and mental health issues than in the rest of the Medicaid population and the rest of the uh, general population. So the next slide uh, shows uh, that we have a prevalence, a percentage of people suffering from addiction. Uh, the red is the expansion population and the blue is the existing Medicaid population. So again, you can see that states vary widely in the prevalence, um, but they're now Medicaid, which previously covered pregnant women, children, disabled uh, people, it, it's, it's a whole new world for Medicaid and they're trying to work that out. And, and all of this means billions of dollars for the treatment industry which uh, the uh, venture capital uh, folks, uh, private equity folks, have, have, has not gone unnoticed. So there is some sense that there will be more treatment options, more money put into the business of addiction, as well as doctors uh, who, who can now be paid and, and clinic, uh, federally qualified health clinics. So that money will is there potentially, as well as new money in the 2017 budget and money that was just dispersed, uh, nearly 100 million went to uh, health clinics, community health clinics. So the money is starting to flow and that is a piece of good news. Um, well, you know, how enough uh, treatment professionals will be able to mobilize and 
uh, develop capacity in the places that need it most is another question, but that's something states are also working on. Just checking, Representative Nigren, are you with us now? I think while we sort out our panelists' technical problems here, if anyone has any questions for Chris, go ahead and type them in and we'll take those now. Okay, so here's a question for Chris. Yep. I okay. Um, regarding opioid abuse in seniors, what effect, if any, do you believe that the Medicare reimbursement rates calculated from the hospital consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems survey questions? asking seniors to assess their pain management in inpatient hospital settings may have. Can tying financial incentives to patients' perceptions of their pain levels have an influential effect on physicians' prescribing habits? Um, that is not a topic I've covered in depth, but I have heard uh, many physicians say that the patient satisfaction ratings in hospitals um, is, is a big issue um, in that patients, uh, if they're happy because their pain is relieved, they're going to get a better rating. So that when doctors try to follow the CDC guidelines and really uh, attempt to use other options before uh, moving to opioids, they may get bad ratings. And this is a big and serious problem. I think, I think that's what the questioner is asking about, and, and that's the extent of, of it. I do know that um, policymakers are looking at making those ratings uh, less, uh, less of an issue and possibly changing uh, the, the patient satisfaction um, form survey that's filled out. Does that? Okay. And Chris, okay. someone is asking that while we're waiting, if they could see your slide again about the number of prescribers per capita. Yeah. And then another question, how much? How oh, much that's the buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. How much does pain? Oh, um, how much did pain as the fifth vital sign contribute to our current crisis? Oh, that, that is a, a, a very huge um, factor. We have this slide up now, and this is a slide um, about buprenorphine prescribing. I think that's the one that you wanted. <coughs> so this is an indication of uh, doctors, primary care doctors uh, for the most part, but also some addiction specialists. And um, they, are, uh, they have to register with the DEA and take an eight-hour course. Uh, and so there's a disappointment, I would say is the best word, uh, among policymakers that more doctors haven't done this. And when they do get their registration or their waiver, it's called, um, they often are treating either no patients at all or two or three. Uh, there, are pa there are doctors who are specializing in addiction treatment who are going all the way up to the limit, which is currently 100, although um, 
Health and Human Services has proposed increasing that limit to 200 patients. Now, as far as the Joint Committee, um, just if that's still a question, um, that it, when th when that uh, was taught, uh, you know that that ruling uh, advice came out. It affected all healthcare professionals. And uh, because pain is very subjective, it really did have a big influence on how many opioids were prescribed in doctors' offices and in hospitals. So that was that is considered an important factor in the rise in prescribing of opioids, and, and thus the rise in addiction and overdose deaths. Okay, thank you. And while we're waiting, um, we have Amber Widgery here who is an NCSL analyst who covers the issue from the criminal justice perspective, and she's going to talk for a couple of minutes about some activities that states have been undertaking. Yes, hi. Um, Amber Widry here. I'm just going to broadly cover some recent state actions, um, policies that states have been working to implement to address this issue in particular. And I'll start off, I know we've talked a little bit about access to naloxone, um, but I'll just give some background. Naloxone is a life-saving drug that acts almost immediately to reverse an opioid overdose. Mexico was the very first state in 2001 to broaden access to naloxone beyond just access in emergency rooms by allowing laypersons to administer it without any legal repercussions. Today, there are 47 states that have enacted naloxone access laws, and in the last five years, states have really worked in particular to broaden those laws concerning access to and distribution of naloxone. Um, states have expanded their access in a number of ways, um, first by allowing for third-party prescription and administration by expanding community programs, ex including expanded access for law enforcement and other emergency personnel and school personnel, even um, both at the university and secondary school levels, and then also by authorizing or implementing standing orders and making the lock zone available, um, sort of described as over-the-counter at local pharmacies. Um, a second approach that coincides with the naloxone laws is the Good Samaritan or 911 immunity laws that have also been described. New Mexico, again, was the first state to enact a Good Samaritan law, and that happened in 2007. Generally, these laws provide immunity from criminal offenses and other legal, legal repercussions as an inducement to encourage people to call for emergency medical help in the event of an overdose. Um, prompt medical atti attention is crucial in the event of an overdose, and even if naloxone has already been administered. Today, there are 36 states that have enacted a Good Samaritan law of some kind, and recently states have focused on expanding those laws as well. Recent expansions have included broadening who is covered by immunity when medical assistance is sought, and also broadening the kinds of crimes covered by the immunity, so what offenses um, immunity is provided for. Um, states vary widely on the type of immunity that is provided, everything from you know providing only immunity for simple possession all the way through all controlled substance offenses. Um, another policy that we've seen sort of come up both at the local level and from the state level is what we call law enforcement assisted diversion programs or LEAD programs. Law enforcement assisted diversion programs authorize law enforcement officers to connect specific offenders to community-based services in lieu of booking them into jail and initiating criminal prosecution. Case managers connect these participants with services such as housing, health care, job training, substance abuse treatment, and mental health support. Programs are also frequently structured to facilitate a substantial amount of interagency coordination. One of the earliest programs was in Seattle, for example, and it was governed by a policy coordinating group that was made up of representatives of many different local agencies and law enforcement representatives. So far, no LEAD program has been created or specifically authorized by law. However, several states have worked to provide existing local programs with funding and other resources. Um, Pretrial substance abuse screening and conditions of release has also been sort of an area of concern for legislators. Some states have used arrest, booking, and pretrial release as an opportunity to identify as individuals with needs related to substance abuse. Um, as part of evidence-based pretrial risk assessments or other evaluations. Once a defendant has been identified, courts in some states are then authorized to order a defendant to seek treatment or other services as a condition of pretrial release or secured bond. Um, both Vermont and Kentucky have recently taken actions on this area and would be good examples. 
Um, diversion programs and drug courts are also another policy area that has recently been looked at by states. At least 26 states have created or authorized statutory diversion alternatives that are aimed at addressing the criminogenic needs of defendants with substance use disorders. Um, many additional programs have been created at the local level. However, state laws often provide structure, oversight, or guidance on best practices. Some states do not specifically authorize or regulate diversion options, but support them with funding resources. Thanks, Sam. Hello, Lauren, I'm on. Um, oh, okay. Okay, so who do we have on? This is Don Perdue. Oh, great. Okay, go ahead. You're on. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm so sorry for all of this, folks, because it's hard to say what had happened. At any event, I am very pleased to be here today. The information thus far provided is extraordinary. But I want to talk to you a little bit uh, in more specific about West Virginia and what we see here. Um, the measure of where we are, West Virginia is the worst in terms of drug overdose in the United States. Huntington, West Virginia, near where I live, is the worst of West Virginia. So we live at the real epicenter of uh, overdose uh, in the United States. Our experience is far more vast than we would like. Um, we have talked about many times about the fact that we need to accept that substance abuse is a disease. Well, uh, Mayor of Huntington put it even better. He said that substance abuse is really a symptom. The disease is hopelessness. We have to consider that and deal with that. As I work through my presentation today, I'll touch on that. Um, what do we do? Where do we go? Well, the first thing we have to do is stop asking why and start asking how. And that's what all states have to do. We have to figure out how to deal with the problem rather than simply trying to figure out why it happened in the first place. We know why. What I just referred to, the disease, is really hopelessness. We have to find a way to overcome that. There are four avenues that we must travel down, and each one of these avenues is going to take an investment of not only money, but time and real and genuine effort. First of all, we need to deal with prevention, and I'm talking about K through eight, um, at least initially to talk about that. We need to think about the fact that many children in elementary school are trying drugs for the first time at a very, very young age. I believe in West Virginia. Uh, the age of addiction for tobacco is 11 years. I mean, that's when it starts for, for many, if not most. But we have to consider that, that entire elementary school process and what's going on there in terms of how we're going to speak to our children and what we're going to say. Um, we also need to think about that move up from the eighth grade on into high school. Um, I think that one of the things that we're missing here that we really need to take advantage of is to utilize peers and there are recovery high schools uh, who can speak to those individuals at your, at your high schools, can speak to them one-on-one -on -one as peers. That, as we well know, parents know this, that kids learn from other kids, and they listen better to other kids. So I think that that's something that we need to be thinking very strongly about, and we are in West Virginia. We need to think about the second avenue here is intervention, and that's, that has to do with drug dealers and courts and corrections. We need to be very, very explicit as to who we're after here. We're not after the necessarily the user. We're not at looking at the uh, at the end of the line. We need to get upstream. We need to get at the uh, beginning of that terrible black rainbow. Um, things like naloxone are new to our lexicon in many ways in Murray West Virginia. But using uh, naloxone to save somebody from a heroin overdose or an opiate overdose is an amazingly effective thing. We have seen it already in our state. Lives, many lives have been changed. But within that, there's the question of recidivism. I had a call just the other day from an individual uh, who works in, as a first responder or a director of first responders, and they said they were very upset about the fact that they often seem to be going back and saving lives from the same person. Well, that's a, a moral question, isn't it? but it's not one that should be that difficult to answer. What we do, or what we should be doing, is thinking about this as buying time for that individual to get to that point where we can get them in some kind of treatment and recovery. Uh, and that is extremely important. One of the other things we're doing in West Virginia is something called the, uh, in harm reduction, it's actually called Handle with Care. And that is a case where if a child uh, is in a situation where their parents have been arrested 
or there have been uh, there's been drug use or an overdose in their home, that the uh, authorities, the law enforcement authorities, notify school uh, officials to let them know that day in school and for the next several days or whatever or whenever uh, those children are going to need a little extra attention. And that seems to be very, very effective in terms of at least lessening the trauma that we see in children being involved in that kind of situation. Uh, we know that uh, Suboxone uh, and uh, Dimitrol, uh, those are the trade name products that are used to sort of substitute or, or to, to, I'm sorry, to redirect uh, what's going on with uh, substance abuse. But it is a double-edged sword, as been said. Uh, one of the things we have seen in West Virginia that there have been a number of physicians open practices and they, uh, for Suboxone pretty much only, and they uh, use a very high dose for a very long period of time. And that's not the recommendations of the package insert. So we need to be thinking about that double-edged sword. Yes, it is extremely helpful and productive, but it can become a real issue if the one thing that has to be applied, and that is something I'll talk about later, is behavioral health uh, in terms of, of uh, of a direction uh, as, as different from uh, utilization of another drug. Um, treatment, well, that's what I'm talking about, uh, essentially. Things like methadone, suboxone. You know, there is an argument that says you're substituting one drug for another, and actually, uh, if you think about it, it's, it's fairly crass, I guess. The industry that gave us the issue is also going to give us a cure, but at what price? At what price? We need to be aware of the fact that those kind of therapies uh, can be very expensive, and especially if they never reach the uh, the end of the rainbow, so to speak. They never get to the point where um, that individual is actually recovering. Um, it's, uh, it is that very much so a double-edged sword. Now, in recovery, the last element that I would talk about, the best I've seen, the most productive has been peer-directed uh, and long-term. One of the things we learned about West Virginia a good while back was we didn't have very many beds for long-term recovery. We still don't. We're developing, we're developing them, but they've been mostly for men. And now we're moving into a, a, a different venue. And if you think about the fact that I will iterate to you that West Virginia, in West Virginia, 20% of the mothers, uh, of, uh, of, of pregnant women, of those mothers, uh, have a substance abuse problem. We know that. So we, then we must know that our NICUs are filled up, literally, with children that have been exposed to substances and need to be weaned off. So in the knowledge of that, we need to desperately, and we need to do this nationwide, move to long-term uh, recovery facilities for women and their children. We have a program like that in West Virginia now called, um, I've forgotten the first name now, but anyway, it, it is a program that we send where literally babies who are born are able to go there and be kept there for a period of time as they're detoxing and at the same time uh, working with mom to get her into some kind of recovery program. Uh, and it's, uh, it's early on, but it seems to be very productive. Um, we know that long-term recovery can be expensive, but it's less expensive than sending somebody to jail for a period of time. In West Virginia, we have a, 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 an agent uh, called Recovery Point. It was the healing place that treats its individuals with behavioral health treatment, abstinence treatment, uh, for $30 a day. That's considerably less than what it costs us to incarcerate somebody. So I think uh, recovery is an extraordinarily important component, um, and uh, I highly recommend that you look at peer-directed recovery as, in my view, being first the best uh, that I have seen. Um, we, we need to understand that where uh, substance abuse is concerned, where true addiction is concerned, it's as though you're walking into a, from a lighted room to a dark room and the door is slowly closing behind you. And as you're in there, as the dark increases and the light decreases, then suddenly you come to realize, or at some point you hope you come to realize, before the door completely closes, that in that light there is hope and a way to get away from that dark place. Um, we've got to be able to commit enough resources. We need financial resources, physical resources, uh, 
you know, people who are thinking about and working at, literally working at, uh, substance abuse issues day to day, every day, 365 days a year. So we've got to commit those kind of resources and the financial resources across all four of those areas I described. Because beyond that, we really don't have much hope ourselves. Um, so we've got to get to the point where people have the opportunity to see a successful future, to reach some kind of validation, some kind of external validation other than uh, a needle or some tablets or pills of some kind. And with that, uh, I will I will end and and pass it back to our uh, to to Lauren. Actually, I guess to Thank Lauren. Yes. Thank you, Delegate Purdue. So we we did lose um, Representative Nigren, but we do have a, a, one of his staff members, Jenny Malcor, who's familiar with the issue, is going to do a quick run through of some of his slides. So thank you, Jenny. Jenny, are you there? Hello? Jenny? Okay. Okay. We're having some trouble with the, the sound being muted. But we do have quite a few questions, so I think we'll go ahead and um, take some of those. The One of the next questions is, um, geared toward either Chris or Delegate Purdue. What are some of the top solutions states are looking at to get their arms around these problems? Um, Delegate Purdue, um, you want yes, to speak to that? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Um, well, I think, as I said before, one of the very first things that, that comes up particularly right now in West Virginia, is because we're in such financial straits here. You're going to have to establish some priorities that are uh, that are far different from what you have had. Um, and that's been going on for enough time to where the, some of those priorities have actually been lost in the length of delay. Um, if, you, uh, if, if you look at, at where we've come over the past 10 years, you know, West Virginia saw the rate of overdose deaths go up 400 percent, 600 percent in 10 years. That's 600 percent. Now that's an amazing statistic. And yet we did not respond in, by putting more funding into the programs that we need. We actually cut funding for some of those programs. So you have to be very aware of, of where you are. Uh, your state has to be very aware of where you are uh, in, from a financial, from a fiscal standpoint but at the same time be able to establish substance abuse issues as having the priority in your state. Hello? Okay, thank you. Chris, yes. do you have anything to add? Well, I think we talked about many of the things states are doing, and I think overall that uh, anyone deeply involved in this would say states have to do a lot of things, not just one thing. Um, Representative Purdue is correct. There needs to be more money. There are pockets where communities are being served pretty well, but as the epidemic grows, they need more money and more uh, people, more health care workers. So um, there's, there's not anything that can be done that, that solves it right away. It's a continuous process. The naloxone and Good Samaritan laws are a, a huge trend, and uh, the number of lives saved is, is going up. So that is, that is uh, going up pretty quickly. That's a good one. Um, and I think overall getting insurance companies and Medicaid to pay for this and, and pay for the right kind of treatment at the right time. They talk about a continuum of care, um, not just detox, not just residential, but no um, access to medication, uh, not medication, but no counseling, but getting it all together um, through a series of decisions made through Medicaid and, and regulating insurance companies and um, providing incentives for more um, doctors and other health professionals and peers to get into this 
uh, profession. So a lot more people are needed and states are doing things along those lines. Um, more reporting, better reporting on death certificates and reporting of, of neonatal abstinence. I think we need more data and more research. Uh, those are a few of the things that certainly getting, uh, enforcing, prescribing guidelines for opioids, working with the medical community. I know a number of states are, are doing that in addition to the CDC guidelines and attempting to uh, law enforcement and um, finding pill mills, eliminating pill mills, and also um, detecting people who are, are so-called doctor shoppers who are uh, going to various doctors. So looking at a database, a doctor can say, can see that they've already gotten sedatives and opioids from other places and not prescribed. So stopping the flow of opioid painkillers or not stopping it but curtailing it, I think is a big area where states have, have made some progress and are continuing to work. I'm, I'm really glad that the issue of uh, Medicaid was brought into the conversation. I wish I'd mentioned it before. The name of the program in Huntington, West Virginia, uh, where they're actually taking care of mothers and uh, abstinence, neonatal abstinence victims, uh, is Lily's Place. And it really needs assistance in terms of the way it gets its funding. And we need to see that uh, probably across the nation. That means we are asking for federal help. We must. We don't really have a choice, especially in our state. But at the same time, directing that help to the right place, I'm afraid the folks in Washington don't really understand the, the depth of the water here where the tide is rising. So this next question is kind of along the same vein as to what Chris was talking about earlier. Which states have seen an actual decrease in narcotic prescribing levels, and what, if anything, have they done on a legislative level to achieve that? I can't give you that information, but I do know that nationally the number is declining somewhat as and the number of people addicted and dying of overdoses from opioid medications has stabilized, but I don't have any specific um, state numbers. Um, certain states stand out as having done more. Massachusetts, uh, for example, is a state, um, so that, that would be one to look at, New York as well. Um, but I don't have those numbers. Well, one of the things we've seen in West Virginia is the, as the numbers of uh, opioid prescriptions went down, and they had gone down in a significant way, the same token, and we've all seen this, I'm sure, the rate of heroin overdose and the amount of heroin that's actually out in the streets has gone up dramatically. Right. Um, that issue, I think that issue is one that's uh, somewhat debated. and. Um, some, some experts say that addictions um, will progress to heroin even, even without um, opioids being cut off. Um, but something I, I want to add, as, as opioids are curtailed somewhat and as doctors are looking at alternatives to opioids and possibly detecting, not possibly, but likely protect, detecting many people who are taking opioids as prescribed as being addicted, um, there, is a, there is a sort of um, uh, sense that there will be new counted as addicted that aren't currently being counted by national surveys. Um, SAMHSA's survey asks people if um, they ha you know, have a problem with a substance abuse and whether they've sought treatment. Well, if you're taking your Percocet as prescribed, you may not answer that question as having a problem. So there is um, uh, expectation that there will be even bigger numbers of people identified as being addicted. Yes, and at the same time, we see that relationship between um, buprenorphine and heroin as being pretty counterproductive as well. I think the statistics that we need more reporting, I think uh, that was suggested earlier, we desperately need greater reporting capacity and, and delivery of uh, the statistics and to gain a better understanding of where we are. It doesn't take any, anything away from where we need to go, but it does establish uh, probably a starting point that, uh, uh, that it would be more uh, profoundly drawn. Right.
sorry. Um, so there are a number of questions about naloxone, and should individuals be able to access it without training? Should there be registration or licensures? Um, what are some of the safety concerns about having it so accessible to people who are not trained? Do any of you want to comment on that? Um, I, I could comment, uh, but I'm sorry. Um, uh, well, I, I've, I've been to some of the trainings. They're pretty quick. I think training is definitely needed. Um, and I, I was in Baltimore, for example, and training was being uh, provided from card tables set up in street corners, and people were given a, um, a certificate that, that said they had been through the training and, and they could show this to law enforcers if they were found with, with, the, with naloxone kits. They could also go to a drugstore and get another one if they use one. Um, I, I think the training is necessary, but I don't understand, um, as my understanding is there isn't harm that can be done. Um, you, you should first, the first part of the training is make sure that the person is having an overdose. So uh, rather than sleeping or uh, intoxicated with alcohol or something. But uh, my understanding is that even if that is the case, the naloxone is not going to harm them. That's a great uh, discussion, and it's absolutely correct. Uh, if someone is not uh, suffering from, uh, I'll say, and you administer an awesome, nothing's going to happen. One of the things we did in West Virginia is we made it available over the counter uh, at the prescription pharmacy counter, much in the same way that you would get uh, a pseudofedrin uh, under the uh, under the tenets of the of the previous laws. And uh, it remains to be seen because we, we just started that. Uh, how that's going to work, but where first responders have been delivering it for a year now, uh, the response has been very good, and I don't know of any negative uh, commentary other than the recidivism that I spoke to earlier. Okay, thank you. So we're about out of time, so I, I just wanted to start the wrap-up and let you know that this webinar was recorded and will be archived on the NCSL website. And if you have any questions following this event, please feel free to contact, oh, go to the next slide, please. Um, feel free to contact Christine Vestal from Stateline or Carmen Hansen or Amber Widgery from NCSL. Their contact information is listed on the screen. And as a reminder, the information highlighted today along with additional resources is available on both the NCSL and the Pew websites if you can. Um, Go to the next slide, please. Um, and then finally, I want to thank you all for bearing with us as we had a little bit of technical problems on this, and we appreciate your patience. And lastly, please, please take a moment to share your feedback on this webinar by taking a short survey at the link listed on the screen in the next slide. Oh, there it is. Thank you. And thank you very much for your interest and participation today. Thank you.